What's up, everyone? This is Thiago, and you're listening to the Hexdevs podcast. Today is a very special day because we have a very spe special guest today, my good friend Kenny McKenzie. How are you doing, man? Uh, great, yeah. So Kenny is the chief product officer at Predictable Revenue, and he knows a lot of stuff about product management and finding product market fit and running customers' interviews and all of that. So I'm really excited to have you here. Thanks so much for coming. My pleasure. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background? Sure. So, um, I mean, I'm someone who's had a really weirdly varied sort of career experience. I've been, I've worked in, you know, commission sales. I've uh, apprenticed as like an electrician for a little while, drove a forklift. I was a professional cook. Um, and, then, and but the whole time I like programmed as a hobby um, in high school oddly enough they discouraged me from going into computer science they thought it was a bubble and it was like there's no future in it this was like around the dot-com crash so um, so I kind of got steered away from that and then it, and then it just sort of drew me back in because I uh, kept making websites and doing things for fun and odd jobs and that sort of thing and then uh, kind of pulled me back in I started as a software developer in my early 20s and um, eventually started my own startup kind of starting as a software developer and we were very like product first technology first we were actually really fixated on wearables um and uh you know at the time that wasn't really a term like we helped coin the term frankly or at least like we were kind of contributing to that hype bubble <laughs> at the time <laughs> and not really even realizing what it was um when it was going on so this was you know back in like 2013 2012 that kind of timeline and um, from that experience, you know, so we built a company and we got pretty far, you know, we raised a couple million dollars. We actually did some revenue, but we really struggled to make it sustainable. And in the end, it all sort of collapsed and, um, you know, the business failed uh, largely because, you know, there's a variety of reasons, but the core of it was, you know, we didn't build something that people wanted and we didn't, we couldn't sell like what we'd built consistently enough to have a sustainable business. So, um, you know, ultimately we got the product market fit wrong. And um, since then I, have spent just um, you know loads of energy trying to reflect on those mistakes and like where uh, what I missed and um, yeah and and sort of dug in and I've read I don't know so I think I'm around seventy ish books now on you know psychology and business strategy and product market fit and and anything that kind of touches up against product market fit and frankly like uh, you know when I was kind of reflecting on that experience I sort of decided for myself of, okay I want to know how to do this. And also it feels like it's harder, like as I learned more, it's like this is so much harder than I feel like it should be. Like so many people kind of are getting this wrong and, and why is it so common? And so I kind of wanted to take some responsibility for making it easier for everyone else too um, while figuring out how to do it myself. And so that's kind of been my focus. I figured it would be my focus for about 10 years. So if I can crack that nut, like meta, solve product market fit, not just for one business, but like make it solvable for everyone kind of thing. Like what's the underlying first principles at play? Um, and so that's kind of the journey I've been on. And the last year and a half, I've been with a company called Predictable Revenue, uh, which is like a sales development company. Um, so they basically help custom companies that need customers. You can kind of think of it like they're a store for customers. Like if you need customers, you go to Predictable Revenue to help you find customers. And um, in particular, their focus is on B2B. So if you're trying to sell to businesses. Um, and I've learned a lot about sales development there and more about product market fit. And I've been able to take some of the product market fit theory and apply it in the context of sales development and see what that looks like and, and sort of um, what is useful and what isn't and um, learn even more about it from that. So you realized that the main reason your startup didn't succeed was mainly because you didn't have demand for the product at the time. Hmm. But... Is there a way for you to discover that before you crash? Yes. Um, the problem is, so there are so many layers to what you to that question. I'll walk you through sort of how I learned what I did wrong, because I think that will ultimately answer your question. Because there's a, there's like these kind of multiple ways of answering the question. Mm -hmm. There's the like, like it's almost like there's like the the, the tactical way like the sort of, and it's funny because I'm going to echo this later, I think at some point, um, but there's like the tactical level, there's like the strategic level, and then there's like the value level, like the like the thing that like you want most. And so, um, you know, my story is, you know, wow, I basically I, at some point I decided for myself, I want to be a startup founder. So I did the things that I thought I needed to be a startup founder. Unfortunately, I didn't really say to myself, I want to be a successful startup founder. I mean, 
it's almost like implied and you would I, I, at the end of the day it's not like I wanted to be unsuccessful but I put too much emphasis on being a startup founder and not enough emphasis on building a business and so that was kind of you know me part of part of it but when I reflected on you know um, what had happened and, and I was learning all these different books and things I part of what I did is I interviewed a bunch of other entrepreneurs and asked them well how do you approach this sort of a situation like product market fit because I mean here's the thing when you have a business and you've built a product and you can't sell it and you talk to customers and it feels like they don't get it then you don't have product market fit and so if ultimately you run out of cash and energy and the business dies because that you know you never or you know that it's just I don't know that's obvious like if you run a, if you can't sell it and then you run a cash and your business dies to me it's like quite obvious oh it's you never found product market fit like that's a, sort of a milestone or a threshold you reach in a business and uh, you know there's some really good stuff online about like what that looks like and there's a really famous article like product market fit was originally um, sort of coined by oh, I hope I don't get this wrong I think it's Mark Andreessen um, I sometimes get Hor Ben Horitz and Mark Andreessen mixed up but um uh, you know, and really it talks about like the market is like ripping it out of your hands. Like you can't like true full product market fit is like you can't like you're 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 struggling to keep up with demand. Like your money is entering your bank account faster. You can spend it. And, you know, the servers are crashing because so many people are there's so much load and like all these sorts of things. And so it's very obvious. And you know, there's a spectrum where, you know, you can kind of get close to that. But basically, if you're selling deals and things are moving and you have a profitable business, you probably have some degree of product market fit. And if that's not happening, then you don't. So when I reflect on that, it was really obvious. Now, when um, when I learned how to better see that, like, especially for someone new, what I found was, okay, there's these things you can do, like validation exercises. But in interviewing a lot of entrepreneurs, I found that the really experienced entrepreneurs who had been through painful failure knew that that's what they needed to do because of like this emotional feeling like you know, from everything I've learned about psychology deep down people make decisions for emotional reasons and then justify them with like sort of logic after the fact so there's usually like even if you think you're being really systematic and logical about things you're probably being far more emotional than you realize like everyone and um so when I kind of went through this exercise of unpacking, okay, well, why are people struggling with this? How common is the problem? And can I solve it by making a tool? Because that was part of my hypothesis. Though. I bet you if I can make this easier, more people will do it. And what I found was, I, I, it was really like the, the, the gold nugget at the core of the whole thing is like, most startup founders don't want to prove themselves wrong. Um, there's an inherent bias. They, they go seeking information. They, they, they hear what they want to hear and they go seeking the information that proves themselves right because they've attached themselves to the um to their idea and see here's the here's the kicker it's like i don't know if anyone's really thought about this or really kind of been in this situation but uh when, when you when you're when you're like not being paid or you're like doing something out of your own time your own blood sweat and tears like you're making a choice to like do all this extra work uh if you're doing it purely for someone else and not sort of an intrinsic reason like a, there's no intrinsic motivation it's really hard it's like a lot of like it's just all this extra like emotional energy you have to invest into like getting yourself to do it whereas if like you're doing something for like this intrinsic reason and it's like exciting it's a lot easier and like that's what pulls people so yeah okay to answer your question it's like there's um the tactical level which is you you need to do validation exercises you need to interview customers you need to um run experiments and things like that and then there's the strategic level, which is like you need to be trying to treat your business model, like not just your product idea, but the whole business model, like who's buying it? Why are they buying it? How do you find them? How do you talk to them? Like, where, how, do you, like how do you reach them? What channels? Like, do you reach out to them on LinkedIn or, or Instagram or do you email them or do you meet them at a conference? Or like really, like how do you connect with your customers? Um, how much are you charging for it? How much does it cost you to deliver it? Like, uh, you know, all these different things. What's the value proposition? Like what KPIs do you measure? Um, to track your progress like this is these things make up the business model and this is a strategic level and you need to be thinking about that all those things and treating them like a theory right and each of those little like things I just listed off are like an individual hypothesis and you need to be trying to test that so that's a strategic level but then at the value level like you need to treat yourself like someone who is trying to solve a problem for people that you personally feel like matters like you care about the people you're trying to help and you think that that problem is important and you want to solve it. 
So it has to, frankly, I think it has to start from that. And a lot of people are, aren't there. So, you know, I could tell, I could say, you know, interview customers or you know, do this experiment or whatever. And most of the time they'd be like, okay, yeah, that sounds like good advice. And then they don't do it because deep down they're attached to their idea. They don't want to prove their idea wrong because they're stuck on, you know, I want to be a startup founder or I want this product vision thing I have to be realized, not I want to specifically help this group of people. I guess it takes a lot of humility to say that because I'm pretty sure a lot of people will go through the same thing, but there you will say, oh, actually, no one understood my products instead of, oh, no, wait, yeah, I did this wrong. I was not prepared. So, yeah, thanks for talking about that. That was really good. And also, I think it's very, very hard to detach yourself from the stuff you're doing because yeah. you're doing this thing, you've built this little go app and you say oh i'm gonna make millions of dollars off of it it, it really hurts when someone says oh your idea sucks or oh i, I don't want to buy this so people it takes a long time for them to realize oh maybe i don't have product market fit maybe no one wants my thing right yeah and it's funny because like it takes some time right like if you raise some money it takes let's say a year so how can you spend a year trying to sell one thing and not realize that, oh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I should like question my idea or maybe I should question the whole business and start listening to people and trying to find the market for my idea. So how can you detach yourself from your little ideas and start looking at and trying to find a market for your, your idea? Yeah, um, I mean, I think like, so. Really, what you're what you uh, you want to do is you want to detach yourself from the idea and attach yourself to the problem, right? So, first of all, you want to really understand, and you know maybe we can dig into this more, you know, later on or, or something. Um, like, what is the problem you're solving? Because there's like most people, like a lot of people are very vague about what a customer problem pain, like customer problem, customer pain, customer need, um, customer want. Uh, market need, like all these, all these, bling, like what do they really mean, right? Like how do you actually know whether one is real or not, and like what does that look like? And there's things that you know measure product market fit. Like once you have a product, you can do customer satisfaction surveys and things like that. But if before you have a product, if you're trying to understand, well, what's a market need, and be able to like ar articulate that and sort of define it in a way that's accurate, um, I think that's like part of the challenge is people don't know how to do that. So it's hard for them to attach themselves to something if they can't even define it. Um, but you're asking like, okay, you're already attached to a product idea. How do you detach yourself from it? Um, and because let, let me be clear, like if you're not attached to something, like if you don't have some intrinsic motivation, you're probably gonna not get up every day and grind day in, day out, over and over, and like you know, blood, sweat, and tears, all the things that are necessary to build a successful startup. Like it is hard, right? And so you've got to be inspired. You've got to have that intrinsic motivation. So it's not about detaching yourself completely. It's just about detaching yourself from your idea. Um, I think like, I don't know, to be honest, I haven't come across a shortcut. Everyone that I feel like really gets it either learned it from the beginning before they got too attached to anything or went through some sort of painful realization. Now you can potentially speed up that painful realization. Like if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, oh my God, I might be in this situation and you want to take this seriously. Um, basically you need to like aggressively go after sales and prove it by selling it. And if you can't do that, um, then you probably haven't figured it out and you might be in that situation. Um, the problem is most people are gonna, you know, they could go and spend a bunch of time and then say, you know what, I just stuck at sales, so I'm gonna hire salespeople. And, and like that's, or sales leader, VP sales or whatever, director sales. So, and that was one of the you know, early mistakes I made is, you know, I thought, okay, I'm not good at sales, so we're gonna solve this problem by bringing in someone who's good at sales. So we hired a salesperson and they couldn't sell it because, you know, there was, wasn't a market need or it was like, and that's and frankly, those early days, like you need to take full responsibility for it. You can't try and offload to someone else. Like if you're a tech person or, you know, maybe a little bit of business, but you're not super good at sales, like don't go looking for a salesy co-founder. Like if you have your vision, you have like your passion, like it's up to you to find your first few customers, even if you're an engineer or, or whatever. Um, don't try and offload to somebody, offload that to some, somebody else. How long should you wait until you realize that there's no market for my idea? Like, should you wait a month, a year? Like, should you burn a bunch of money trying to understand the market? Or maybe, maybe that's a better idea. Maybe you should find the market first and find the problem first, and then that will guide you 
to to a solution, right? Yeah. So first you find the market, like do something like a market product fit, like yes. uh, Amy Hoy says that yes. kind of stuff. So yes. you do a, she say like a sales safari, try to find the people that have have the problem. Where do where do they hang out? What do they buy? What do they need? And then you try to figure out a solution. So yeah. what what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, like really, what you're what you want to be doing is like you, like I said, you want to be treating like your business model as a hypothesis and then, or as a theory rather, and then breaking that down into hypotheses, designing experiments and going out and testing them. And so your question about how long should you take or how much money you should spend is totally depends on the situation. Um, you know, if you're building a like product and you're a little startup and you don't have a lot of experience, you know, you're not an experienced startup founder, you're trying to build a product for like fortune 500 companies or like some big traditional industry like manufacturing or, or like resource extraction or shipping or something like that, like slow moving, then like your learning cycle is really slow. Like, frankly, that's just like ill-advised. And that was the mistake I made. We were trying to sell stuff to like mining and oil and gas companies and things like that. Little tiny startup, not a ton of experience. We had a couple like experienced people on the team, but um, as a business, we were um, young and, and a lot of biz, those big businesses, like big ticket items, like you're talking you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollar type of like sales, like you, people won't trust you. Like they want to see like decades of sort of, and like lots of money and lots of, they, they're, they're afraid of you going out of business in a few years. So it makes it even harder. So there's like a trust component there too. But assuming you're like making a product for consumers or like something more accessible, then it should be really fast, like fast and cheap as possible. Like it's always going to be the goal. So part of that is like selecting your market and a market that's accessible to you that you understand um, because you're just trying to do this all like you're not a developer. You're not an engineer. You're not an entrepreneur. You're a scientist slash like private investigator. You're the, uh, the private investigator is you're it's like think of like the market opportunity as like a crime that like there's a criminal that's out in the loose and they keep um, hurting all these different people. All these different people have been hurt by the same criminal, and you're trying to understand that criminal's pattern of behavior. And that, well, the criminal is the market need, right? So you got to approach that like a private investigator. So you're you're investigating. You're not trying to force your will on the world. Um, and then once you understand something that's m like a meaningful problem that people have, then you can start being the visionary and like coming up with a, a whole new potential reality, and then going in and talking to people about that. And I mean, if you're on the right track, people will tell you. Um, but you just like, oh man, the difference between, I guess the thing is a lot of people don't know whether they don't know or they, they don't know until they see it. And so they might think that they're getting signals that they're on the right track because people will say nice things. Most people won't really be honest with you, right? They'll say what they think you want to hear just so that, you know, you go away and they don't, you know, they don't you, whatever, like, like most people don't want to be mean and say, I don't understand what you're trying to talk about. Like, I just don't get it. And and, you know, if, if frankly, if you're hearing a lot of that, like, I don't get it. Or if you're leaving sales conversations thinking, oh, they just didn't get it, then, yeah, you're definitely don't, don't product market fit. Like, it's not that they didn't get it. It's that you don't get it. Um, so maybe you're talking to the wrong person. They're not in your market. And, you know, in some cases, yeah, that's fair enough. Like, if they're not in your market, they're not in your market. But if you are getting a lot of that and you keep going back to the same market and they keep saying the same, like, they don't get it, well, then that's a pretty good sign there. But... I'm curious to know like specifics like yeah should I do like 10 customer interviews should sure. I do a hundred should I do 50 should I do thousands like yeah uh, how, oh. how many like or should you stop until you oh, have yeah. run out of money yeah. when you should stop and when you should switch tracks a little bit yeah see again like the answer varies depending on the situation but generally speaking like you want meaningful data right so like three um like so you do customer interviews and still until you start hearing the same thing over and over again so if you're if you're isolating your market right then like you could potentially do as many as few as like 10 because you know maybe you hear like two or three different types of answers that are all similar but a bit different and then uh, you know first three interviews are three sort of the different answers and then you get to like you know interviews four through six are oh these are the same three answers like over again, you know, different, and then you do like, you know, seven through 10, same three answers. And you're like, okay, I just keep hearing the same things over and over again. You can stop at 10. Um, but you know, if you get to the eighth interview and it's like, oh, there's a new thing. And then the question is like, okay, well, how big is that segment and how important is it? And if that's the thing you want to hear and only one out of 10 people said it, then you need to keep going because you need to understand like, was that an anomaly? Like some people will just hear that once and they're like, oh, that's enough. It's like, no, like my, my general rule is like, 
one is nothing like it's just a randomness two is like maybe a coincidence three is like okay a pattern starting to form so if there's like something that i needed to hear from the market and i did like 10 interviews 20 interviews 30 interviews, what doesn't matter and i only hear what i wanted to hear three times and assuming i'm being very unbiased in my interview style and like following all the best practices bomb tests that sort of thing we can talk about that too um then you know i th then i then i'm asking myself okay well how do i isolate this tiny segment like if it's three out of 30 people I talk to, how do I narrow in and, and how many of those three, that 10%, like how big is that market? Is it like only 50 people in the whole world or 500? How big does it need to be for my business to be viable? Like all sorts of questions like that it starts posing. And then, you know, maybe I need to do another round of like 10 interviews with different targeting, trying to isolate that, those, those ones I want to hear, like hear from or whatever, hear that answer. Um, and if, you know, I try that and let's say I do another 10 interviews and it's like I only get here one more time. So I extend, it's still 10%. It's only 10%. You know, I'm going to basically keep kind of chipping away at that until I feel like I understand the segment and I know how to isolate them and I understand how big they are and how much it matters to them and things like that. So again, like it's not, you can't just say, oh, it should be two months or it should be $50,000 or it should be 30 interviews or whatever. Like it kind of depends on how lucky you got and how, what type of market you're going after and how big your deal size is. Um, like, are you selling something? Are you giving something away for free and trying to sell ad revenue? Or are you, give, are you selling something for 50 bucks a month? Or is it $50,000 like a year or whatever, right? Like these things matter too. Cause some, some markets, they run only be like a thousand people in the whole market. So in that case, mm -hmm. 10 interviews can be hard to get and can take a while to get if you're trying to go after like, you know, some big executives in four to five countries or something like that. But then it's going to be harder anyway, right? Like if you're going after a market that is just only a thousand people yeah. that are interested in that kind of stuff, you're making your life much harder. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're not really well connected into that market. It's one thing if like you've spent the last 20 years in that market um, and you know everybody, then it can be great. Like you're the one to do that. But if you're like not in it and you don't know everyone, you don't have these like deep seated, like, like a strong network. Um, in that exists then then yeah it's like you're making you're like going you're you're starting the game as a new player on the hardest difficulty setting <laughs> <laughs> so you know you can be super arrogant and be like oh, i'll figure it out which by the way i thought that i was that arrogant <laughs> uh, i made that mistake but um i mean you learn a lot but you also face a lot, feel a lot of pain like it doesn't it's not fun failing and especially when you know you've hired a bunch of people and you gotta let them all go and that sort of thing it's not fun yeah, so if I understand what you're saying, like I should go after a market that is kind of large enough uh, to make my life easier. And I can probably kind of validate my suspicion or fi maybe find a, a, a problem, a real pain, yeah. just by talking to maybe 10, 20 people, if I do it correctly. Yeah. So you could do that in like a month maybe. Yeah. Before oh, yeah. even writing any code, before raising any money, you can yeah. just kind of discover that pain even before you you do anything. You spend any any large amount of money or absolutely yeah yeah and and like that, just to be clear, like if we're starting clean slate, like if you're listening to this and you're like, I want to be a startup founder, like I want to take, the, but I don't have a specific idea, like that's fantastic. Most people think they have to have an idea to be able to start a startup. Actually. Mm -hmm what is the better way to start a startup is to have a group of people who you want to help that have a meaningful problem that you ca you and they care about. Um, like you want to feel like it's not about building a startup. It's not about so building a product. It's about solving the problem for these people. If you can start that way, you're like way better position than most people. And you'll have your odds of success will be so much higher. Like the, the, think of it this way. The odds of success are like, depending on the scale of the sex, like minimum, like you're barely alive. It's not really that fun. You're kind of just limping along sort of like, like this wounded animal is about 5%. So 95% fail completely. And, and I, you know, I'm pulling at like CB insights, stats and things. I'm probably bastardizing a bit. So this is take this with a bit of a grain of salt, but it's like generally like I keep seeing the same stats kind of popping up over and over again. So 5%, roughly speaking, you know, to get above that threshold of just surviving. And then like less than like maybe 1% is like some moderate success. Like you'll feel like you've financially won from it in some respect. Maybe you've got a nice cushy job, that sort of thing. But then you you start getting to like 0.1% and beyond for like a real like startup success where, you know, you get some sort of an exit or a windfall. 
And uh, so if those are the real baseline stats. One of the most common biases is like this, like, I forget the name of it, baseline stat fallacy or something. It's mm. like where you think the baseline statistics don't apply to you. Mm. So if you want to hack those odds and actually have better uh, a stat, like better likelihood of success than that, then do what most people don't do, which is start with a real market need and start with a passion for trying to solve a problem for a group of people and a problem that matters to them. Yeah. It's funny that when you were speaking about that, oh, if you are starting from scratch and you are listening to this episode, make sure to find a problem having people's problem in mind. And I'm, I'm here thinking, isn't that the normal way that the other industries work? Like, it seems to me, I, I, might, I might be naive here, but it seems to me that this is a really privileged position of being a tech startup founder where people just give you money and you can do that. You can spend all of their money without even having a problem at first. So I'm here thinking, is there another industry where that happens? But I can't think about it. I can't think about anything well, right now. I think like maybe um, like uh, like research, like post-secondary education research. Mm -hmm. People will get you know uh, funding for like science, scientific exploration, and and that's the thing is a lot of like that sort of mentality seeps into the education system for software engineers. So they think about things like that, like sort of intellectual curiosity, uh, ingenuity, like like basically, uh, you know. I come from, I was a, mostly self-taught, self developer. I did, took some courses in, in college, but like I wasn't a comp sci focus. And so I kind of approached it a bit like an engineer, but you know, there's people who know to build things and then there's people who know what to build. And there's very few people who know what to build versus how to build things. And, but when you are someone who knows how to build things, you're, you know, like you, you're, yeah, like you're basically, you go out looking for a problem to solve. Uh, kind of inherently, but the thing is, usually what people do is they'll they'll have a specific set of sort of expertise around a specific area, and they'll kind of catch some sort of technological curve. Very commonly, you know, they get caught up in like a hype cycle. So for me, it was like wearable hype cycle. Uh, someone else, it might have been blockchain. Like a lot of blockchain startups started up. They had they weren't solving problems, but they got funding because that's so that's like to kind of answer your question. Like part of that, the reason that happens is because of like hype cycles to do with technology engineers who have like this amazing track record and are really know how to build things but no one really did the due diligence to see whether they knew what to build and um yeah and i th and i think that yeah kind of like there is a bit of a pattern of that in like the at universities like funding research and stuff not that there's anything wrong with that it's great it's just don't approach a startup that way <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and um i wanted to say too like you know, we've talked a bit about markets and market needs, and I think it would be maybe helpful for me to take a moment to define how I think people would benefit from defining a market, mm -hmm. like how to define a market. Because, you know, you've probably heard things like the millennial market or the smartphone market or, or you know, whatever, like all these different terms for like what a market is. And it's like, okay, well, what is the smartphone market? Like, isn't that more of an industry? Like if a market is a group of people who need something. Are you saying like, people who need a smartphone like that's like that's like what so um and i think it was anthony alwick uh define yeah it was anthony alwick he like define a market this way and it's basically a like a group of people who are all trying to get the same job done and um yeah that comes from jobs to be done theory but basically it's like imagine this is really important this is like my mental map like my first principles for product market fit it's like imagine that there's like a, a vector of progress that people want to make. And it's in a specific, it follows a pattern. So it's like a verb, an object of control, and a context. So like, listen is the verb, to music is the object of control in my home. Uh, listen to music on the subway. Listen to music while I run, or while I exercise. Listen to music while I run in the rain. Listen to music, you know, at a concert hall. Like these are all sort of these jobs to be done. And you can design a product or an experience or whatever for each of them. And just by changing out the context, but then you can, you know, also change out the verbs and objects. It's literally you can you can define anything this way. And so a market is basically a group of people who are all trying to get that same, make that same progress. Where you, but you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper into that. Like you can dig into, okay, well, why? Why do they want to make them? Like why do they want to listen to music in the rain? You know, okay, maybe they have like 
a goal of getting more fit. Maybe have an aspirational identity of like they see themselves as someone who is fit. Like I want to be and I am someone who is fit. And then so that, you know, can help inform how you design the product, how you market it, all these different things. Yeah, to me, like I always think of like, for example, uh, Brex or PayPal, like startup founders, they don't have um, credit history yeah. for their startup. So they need a, a card. Yes. And then Brex provides a yeah. corporate card for them, even though like they just look at your funding and they give you the card. So Yeah. Maybe. Um, so, you know, it could, that, that's a great example. So, you know, somewhere in there, like there's a lot of, like, this is the thing is it's tricky to find. So like, it takes work. You have to really think about it and you have to kind of like play with it and test the boundaries of it. But here's an example. So, uh, I thank you for bringing that up. So it's like, um, you know, pay, uh, expenses. So verb pay object control expenses, you know, for my startup pay expenses, pay expenses for my startup. Yeah. So it's like, okay, that you look at that job to be done. And you know, you'll then, then this is the thing. So then you run into these like different situations, um, or you know, maybe it's like pay startup expenses over the internet, or um, um, you know, uh, without using any paper, or you know, how you define that context. Like again, this is where you play with those things, um, and you'll uncover like there's like obstacles or friction in that progress. So like I actually went through this. I absolutely was so frustrating. The fact that we had to like basically have our credit cards in our personal name, like in my startup, we couldn't have like a business. We had like a million dollars in the bank account and they couldn't give us like a company credit card. What? <laughs> like it was crazy. So like Brex was like, oh man, about time. When I heard about Brex, I was like, finally. <laughs> um, so, and I, I don't even know what's like in the States. I'm this like, I'm Canadian. So this is, we're talking about Canada here. Um, but, uh, so yeah, that was a very obvious one. So the market would be uh, then, you know, startup founders, obviously, but startup founders, particularly who, you know, want to what, want, like, what's the job to be done. And so, you know, pay expenses, you know, I guess, uh, or, or maybe it's just like, ha like, like use a credit card without having to, uh, personally collateralize it or something, or like have it in my own name, like, uh, have a, like register a credit card in my company's name as a startup founder there, that's probably it there. So like, this is the thing is you kind of have to fiddle with the job to be done. Keep kind of trying out, like I'll brainstorm, like when I'm working with a new client, like I'll come up with like 20, 30 ideas kind of thing and fiddle with it and then map them out and then understand like the whys and hows of it. So why do they want to do that? Why else? Why else? Like how might they try also try to like get this job done? How else? How else? And kind of map out this like, this sort of tree structure almost or like graph structure of like these different jobs to be done and reasons like goals related to them and sort of tasks related to them um and and the friction and obstacles and the negative emotions that they face when people are trying to like struggle with that like frustration and when does that frustration come up and you've probably heard of something like customer journeys and customer and you know uh persona profiles and stories and stuff but for me it boils down to this like job to be done and um, the market is a group of people who are all trying to make the same progress and all struggling with similar obstacles or friction. And yeah. And so like, do you understand that when, when you understand like, what is it that people are trying to do? What's this progress they're trying to make? They're trying to, you know, pay their startup expenses and they, and, and within this context of, you know, you know, on the internet and they don't want to have to like sign on the personal name and they don't have credit or whatever. Um, it becomes really clear what the solution is right? Like inventing the solution becomes a lot easier. And then when you do that and it's like immediately successful because you already have all this demand, you can then make it better and better and better and better and better and like pull away from all the competition. And that's like how you disrupt industries. So it's like, you know, you fixate on that, what that market really is, which is a group of people all trying to make the same progress. So if you try to think of it as like, you know, I'm going to go after startup founders or I'm going to go after software developers. Well, no, no, no. Okay. That's, you got half the picture like less than it's like you got, you're going after startup founders who are trying to make X, Y, Z progress, maybe all for the same reason. They're all trying to make that progress for the same reason, which there may be five different reasons to make that progress. So you're narrowing it down even further and they're all struggling with a similar obstacle. So you, know, you take all startup founders and you cut it down to only ones who are trying to get this job done. And then maybe you cut that down even further to only the ones who are trying to get that job done for this specific reason and only ones who are trying to get the job done for this specific reason facing this specific obstacle. And that's how you narrow it down to like uh, what they would call like a beachhead or like a kind of a, an entry point into the market. If you try to go really broad, then you're just going to waste so much time talking to wrong people. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, methodology 
on how to go about that. But I'm always wondering, like, how do you realize that people have that problem? So do you have to, to like, uh, do you need to have the same problem yourself? Like, do you need to, like, talk to your friends or do you need to know someone that has that problem? Do you need to, like, run customer interviews before you realize that like to to kind of uncover their their pain points and how do you know like when you hear people say oh i, I hate this this is hard like uh, i can get a credit card for my startup how do you know that's a real pain that they would be willing to pay for a solution yeah so there's i mean there's a couple there's a couple different questions i have to have I have to an, there's a couple different answers to what you're saying so for one is like i mean and this i don't think this is really the audience i'll just say it really quickly i'll brush over it but if you have an existing business with customers and it's like a functioning profitable or whatever business and you're looking to expand into like a new product line so you're trying to come up with like a new market need to go after to like grow your business then the best place to start is with your existing customers, understand them better. What other problems do they have that you haven't solved yet that are related to what you do for them? Um, that like, it's always easier to sort of, because then you start building a brand that's known for similar things. Like you don't want to be a brand that has, does all these really weird random things. People won't know, like you won't occupy space in their mind because they won't know how to define you. You don't, you want to be easily definable. You want people, basically as you build your company, you want your brand to be connected to a specific type of progress. So people, when they want to make that progress, they think of your brand. Um, now, that being said, I think most people in this are going to be in a situation where they have no existing customer base to draw upon, so they're really starting from scratch. Um, I mean, maybe I'm not, I, to maybe, the, maybe the honest answer here is I don't know. Um, I think it would definitely help if you experience the problem yourself. Um, I guess I just am not that experienced enough working with different startup founders. I don't have enough of a volume of experience. I feel like someone like Paul Graham or Sam Altman would probably have a pretty decent answer to this. Now I'm curious about Googling what they've said on the topic. I've, if anyone's listening, I'd probably recommend that. Um, what has Y Combinator said on this? Anytime I don't know the answer, I go to Y Combinator. Um, so yeah, so I think the honest answer is probably I don't know, but um, but experiencing yourself certainly helps and people you care about and like you can empathize with. You need to have empathy for it. But now the second part of your qu question, which was how do you know? Um, that's a bit easier. So it's like if you get a hint at a problem, and here's the thing is your problem should matter to you. It's not, you're not just looking for a problem. You're looking for an important problem that you will feel like, like you could grind the next like five to 10 years of your life trying to solve and solving it would be satisfying. So, I mean, there could be money in like making like some accounting process more efficient, but like, is that gonna like get you to work 70 hours a week for six years? <laughs> so, uh, you know, what is it that's gonna, you know, maybe it will because you know you're gonna make lots of money and sure, good on you. And, but is it, if, if if you don't, if it doesn't look you're going to make money, you're going to make a little bit of money. Like, is that, are you going to keep going? Because like, you, there's all these things in, that are going to happen that are going to make you want to quit. So like, how do you keep pushing through all those things? Um, so I think having, you got to have some intrinsic passion for it. Like I said, most people, the common reason, the common thing is they, they have this product vision they want to realize. You want to attach it to a problem. So find a problem that like you can be in love with basically and sort of marry the problem. Um, yeah, I don't know, but but yeah, if if when you're testing that, and you're trying to see is a real problem, kind of goes back to the interviews. It's like ask people, talk to them, um, dig into it with them. Um, mom test, read the mom test. Uh, great perspective. There's lots of other articles out there. Ash Maria does a lot of good stuff. Um, problem interviews by Ash Maria. I think customer forces for Canvas. Um, yeah, there's also like the strategizer stuff, like the value proposition Canvas. I kind of like Ash Maria stuff a bit better though. Um, jobs to be done has stuff. There's jobs to be done interviews you can do. Um, there's like, a, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's someone with strategizers, like a, how to do jobs to be done interviews. Those are good. But basically it boils down to interviewing your customers or interviewing people um, around the problem and uh, better understanding that problem. And part of the, that better understanding is like, how important is it? We talk about customer interviews. Um, I read the mom test book. I think it's amazing. Like it changed my mind about many things. And I think the most important thing that I learned was you gotta, it's not an interview. It's just, it's just a chat, right? Yeah. You, you, you need to chat with someone. You don't need to talk about your idea. Mm -hmm. 
no, yeah. You just need to talk to them and say, hey, so what are you doing? Are you struggling with something right now? Like, are you having a good time like at your job or whatever? And then you kind of try to dig in. Uh, like if they talk about some of their, their problems, you, you try to dig in into that problem without telling them that you have an idea, that you want to have a startup or anything. Because if you mention that, they're going to lie to you. Like yeah. the moment you say, oh, I have this idea, what, what do you think about it? They're going to lie yeah. about it because they don't want to hurt you, right? Yeah. Especially if it's a friend or someone that knows you, they don't want to hurt you. So say, oh, this is a cool idea. Yeah, I could use this. I could see the, 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 the point. And you're going to make lots of money with this thing, you know? And then you get encouraged and then you spend years of your life <laughs> working on that. So, so how do you... How do you feel about uh, interviews or, or chatting with people and trying to, like, yeah. how, how do you do that? Yeah, that's a good, so that's exactly it. Because it's one thing to say, go interview customers, but, like, the reality is, is you have to do it a certain way. You can't just talk to people because otherwise you'll hear what you want to hear. And, like, the most dangerous thing for a startup founder who has built, uh, has launched a startup from an idea or a technology or something like that before a market problem is false positives. Like, False positives are kryptonite. It's what is going to cause you more pain than anything. And it's very easy unless you like really do your research, you read the mom test or whatever, and you kind of do this right. So whatever I say in this here now, like it'll help. But really, like you want to go read a couple articles, read the mom test, uh, read some of Ash Maria's stuff, the running lean or like his stuff about the customer forces canvas, problem interviews, et cetera. Um, it, I'll use this analogy he used because I'll answer your question in a sec. But I want to say this, like Ash Maria has used this analogy. So he says... Um, Building a, a startup with a product first is like creating a key, like designing a very beautiful, like cool looking key and then going door to door trying to open doors with this like key that you made. What are the like, what's the likelihood you're going to stumble pro across a door that you can open with this, some, some key that you made versus you choose the door you want to go through, you study the lock, you, you know, you, you, you somehow mold around the lock and then you design a key specifically f to open that door. Like your odds of success are a lot higher, right? So now... When it comes to the interviews, there's like basically like you want to approach it with genuine curiosity about what matters to this person and what like their what what job they're trying to get done. Like like here's the, like if you're just wanting to solve, so there's two kinds of layers to it. There's two levels. There's uh, almost three actually. There's who do I want to help? So that's the first question you ask yourself. What group of people do I want to help? And then there's what problems matter to that group of people, right? And then there's like, which problem do I want to pursue and how important is that problem? And so, you know, you can start with, I think this group of people have this problem and I want to go investigate that. And so if you're doing that, you'd do it one way. If you're saying, I really want to help this group of people, but I don't know what problems matter and I want to find a problem, then that's a kind of a different thing. And if you're like, I don't even know what group of people I want to talk to or I want to help, then that's like you don't you're not even ready for interviews yet. You got to do some like soul searching or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's. I'm going to assume that you've chosen a group of people and you have a specific problem hypothesis. Somewhat, mm -hmm. maybe it's a bit vague, but um, then I, I would suggest you reach out. Um, and and for, it's really good if like you start with a couple of people you know, just kind of get warmed up because it's scary. It's a new thing. Um, but here's the thing: you approach it with like real curiosity about learning what layer like what they care about what they want and and you kind of explore that and I go read some articles or like I, I can't really explain every like you want to ask questions like um you know like have you ever and um when was the last time and like basically things about the past or maybe current so like it's okay if you can ask like do you have do you currently have any plans to xyz but you, what you want to definitely avoid is hypotheticals don't ask like would you do this mm -hmm. or you know ha like yeah would you do that if you get into the would you kind of thing territory you're really danger territory like that's false positive territory so you want to stick to think past behavior current plans current pains current problems um, past problems etc uh, so that's one big thing and you'll learn that from the other sources i've mentioned but um i think like you know the real trick is approaching it with genuine curiosity about learning the truth and not trying to like prove something because when you approach it when you're trying to prove something like you want to hear a certain answer there's all this tension like it's stressful 
like you you will not look forward to it. Like it'll be, you'll get us all this anxiety. You're like, oh my God, I got to talk to this person. What if they don't say what I want to hear? Like, even if you're not consciously thinking these things are in the back of your mind. And so like it makes the whole experience like much less enjoyable for you and less productive and possibly depending on your communication skills, less, much worse for the other person too. <laughs> um, but if you can approach it like with genuine curiosity and like empathy and, you know, you, you get into the habit of saying things like, oh, man, that's so interesting. And actually the feeling that way, like when they tell you something, like, oh, OK, cool. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. OK, well, what about this? And, you know, OK, have you ever done that? And oh, oh thank you. Oh, man, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. And when you get into that loop with people, people will open up like people will tell you things that you were never realized people would just tell a stranger. And there's benefit to reaching out to like total strangers and doing this because it's like they're not your friend. They're not just trying to tell you what you want to hear. Um, they don't have any preconceived notions of it's like a blank slate. And when you can get to a state where, or like a place or like a kind of a skill level, which really doesn't take, it took me maybe, I, I was a developer, n was not good at like, I read some books and some articles and kind of learned, I read the mom test and stuff. And I started going and doing interviews. I probably did them wrong maybe a dozen times. And then after learning how to do them right, I maybe did like 10 to 15 before I felt like it went click. And I, and I was like, oh, this is fun. Cause like, so it doesn't take a lot for you to kind of get over that hump of like the fear and like kind of get your groove and, and, pe and people are opening up to you and you're learning all this stuff and it's easy. And like you leave the conversations feeling warm and fuzzy because it's like, wow, this person just like opened up their soul to me. They just told me all this personal stuff and they enjoyed it. It was cathartic for them because they got to complain mm -hmm. and someone listened. You know, there's it's like that's you're doing them a service, just like giving them a chance to vent about this problem. Um, you're all, like you're actually helping them just by giving them that like emotional outlet and you get what you needed out of it so it's like versus what you're the other state which is like you just you're trying to get them to say something they don't want to say and they know that and so they're kind of like in this weird awkward position where they're either going to lie to you because you know they want to be nice or they're going to be honest with you and they're going to hurt your feelings and so they don't feel good about it and you don't feel good about it so yeah it's a big different like difference in terms of like how fun it is mm. by doing this right and wrong it's a lot more fun to do it right when you learn mm -hmm. how you you mentioned that you did you did the interviews wrong for a couple of dozen times, but then you eventually learned and you did them right. So when you did them right, did you talk to strangers? Were all of them strangers, and how did you find them? Yeah, so this this was um, me focusing. So. Doing them wrong was when I had my business and I had a product and I was trying to get people to say they wanted my product. Like, like they, you know, I was basically trying to sell my product, but it was, I'm like tricking my, like I'm sort of lying to myself and saying that I'm really doing customer discovery interviews, but I wasn't. I was like hoping they'd want, buy my product or whatever they want my product. Um, and then I switched to, oh, I want to solve product market fit for startup founders. Uh, so I went out and reached out to startup founders and it started with, people that I knew, but like, I didn't want to go to reach out to people like I knew really well. So it wasn't like my closest associate, like startup founder friends. It was more like friends of friends. Mm -hmm. And so I just reached out like, Hey, do you, can you recommend anybody? And every interview, like the interview, inter every interview at the end, I would ask, is there anyone else, you know, that's like in a similar position to you or just another startup founder. And actually I was l trying to talk to the gamut, like junior, like just starting or like, you know, wants to be a startup founder and like, how are you thinking? Like maybe they're just graduated in college or something. It's like, I'm asking them, how do you approach validating your market? And, and I'm asking like people with like 10, 15 years experience, how do you validate your market? And so I was a lot of referrals, reaching out cold network, uh, past like old connections, people I'd met at conferences, things like that. Um, but yeah, they were like my people. Like I was a startup founder, they were startup founders. So th I had experienced that problem myself. Like I always had a bunch of advantages here in that some people, if you've never, if you're trying to solve a problem, you haven't been in the, you know, like fought, thought, fought through yourself and you don't know other people have that problem. It's a lot harder, um, but it can be done. And uh, if it's business related, like if you're trying to solve a business problem, really the best way to find people these days is LinkedIn. Just mm -hmm. like you can do all kinds of searches. If you pay for a sales navigator, you get like really crazy, powerful search capability. And most like if you haven't seen that, oh my God, it'll blow your mind. What you can do, like the people you can find and the information you can find is like crazy. And uh, I mean, I'm almost embarrassed admitting this, but I'm not in on Instagram, but I've heard that Instagram is really, really good for mm -hmm. B2C. Um, I have not done it myself. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Social media is pretty good for finding people generally. 
But I guess when you're just starting out, you need to like do some code outreach. But then after you meet some people, they will refer you to other people that yep. have the same problem. And that kind of validates your yeah. what you're thinking, right? Well, I mean, like if you do it all through cold outreach, like if you reach out to people and you're like, hey, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to solve, I'm trying to help people like you. So, but you don't say people like you. You'll say like, you know, let's say I'm reaching out to, I don't know, HR managers or something. I'm trying to help HR managers with XYZ, this job to be done. I'm trying to help HR managers, um, you know, I don't know, build accountability for remote workers or something. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's really pro hard because of this. Um, you know, I, I don't have anything to sell you, but I'd love to, like, get your perspective and, like, on wh how you're, like, whether or not you have this problem, how you're struggling with it, like, what you're doing, that sort of thing. So, I mean, that kind of stumbled through that wording, and you could probably tighten that up. But generally speaking, like, if you reach out to people cold and you're like, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem for people like you, and um, I'd love to talk to you about it, would you share some time with me? And people say yes. Like, uh, let's say, basically think of it this way. If you're getting a conversion rate above 10%, so in other words, for every 10 people you reach out to, one person says yes to an interview and they're totally cold and they don't know who you are, then that is great. And it's like early validation. Like, it's, you're, it's, they're te it's telling you that these people care about whatever you put in that message, enough to talk to a stranger, even though they might not get anything out of it. Mm -hmm. That problem is so important to them that they're willing to risk wasting 20 minutes or 30 minutes of their time just because there's a chance that you might be able to solve it for them even at some random point in the future, not even necessarily now. So then you really know you're on something. And like, I've done a bunch of these types of, I, I call them experiments. Like that would be like a, an outbound experiment. Um, and like early validation experiment kind of thing, pre, pre interviews. Um, and, and like, I've done like a, 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 on a few occasions, like a suite. So like, I'll do like eight of different sort of experiments. I'll reach out to like, I'm not really sure who the customer is and I'm not really sure exactly what the problem is. So I'll try like, you know, a, like a couple different ways of targeting people and a couple different ways of articulating the problem and, uh, and see what performs the best. And I've done that a few times and had like, um, and we've replicated this with our clients. So we've actually now probably done, like I've witnessed this being done, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 times uh, with as few as maybe six experiments and as many as like 40. So 40 unique combinations of targeting like a group of people and then ha having a specific ask. And there's usually like majority of the time there'll be like a power law distribution. So like mm. um, if you get a positive result, it'll like be one of the 40 ideas or two or three maybe, but like not like half of them. Like the majority of the guesses are wrong. And so like when I've done this for myself, I did between like six and eight maybe tests, like three different kind of rounds and uh, like over the span of a couple of years, like completely different uh, market ideas and stuff. Um, and like, I, you know, I had like, I think the best case of conversion rate was like 12%. So 12% of the cold random strangers I reached out to got on a conversation with me and uh, you know, on, like lots of them were zero, like I got ignored. So um, when you try that and you do these like a few different ways and then you have one that like gets you this really high conversion rate and a bunch that don't, you know you're onto something. Like that's a really good e early signal. And how large is that group of people? Like I said, uh, you did some six experiments. Uh, how many people were you trying to reach? Yeah, so when we, so that's always changing. Um, so my, f you know, my, my, I'll tell you. Uh, my, uh, so on LinkedIn, it was around 50 uh, per experiment. Uh, now you probably like, you know, the last time I did it, I think it was like 50 to hundred, let's say, um, now you might want to bump that up to like 200. So here's the thing about marketing in general is, um, channels become saturated over time. And so conversion rates drop. So when a new channel kind of opens up and like people are flocking to it and it's new and like, there's not a lot of people using it for like marketing reasons, then conversion rates are really high because people aren't used to being messaged on it. And so they're like a lot more attentive to messages and things like that. Mm -hmm. So let's think about like email. Um, I mean, uh, actually like, I like just talking about the whole thing. So it starts with face to face thousands of years ago, right? And then at some point people started like having this idea of like sending a piece of mail and like, I don't know when that started, probably <laughs> hundreds, thousands of years ago, whatever, right? So we had this long period of only sales via face to face in human history. And then we had mail. And then, uh, you know, then we started having telephone 
uh, and maybe telegrams were in there. I don't know if people marketed on using telegrams, but let's just <laughs> skip that and go to the telephone. And now you can start like, start to picture maybe like 80s, 70s, 80s, like big call centers, telemarketers, you know, that sort of thing. And then in the early 2000s, it started to switch to email and it like really hit its heyday like around 2010. But that's like become saturated now. Like conversion rates in 2010 for email, like a good, well, like a sort of a, a an average, like relevant campaign would be like seven to ten percent conversion rate on email. Now, like an average campaign is probably like zero point one percent. I have a cold outbound campaign, and it's illegal in a bunch of countries. Yeah. So it's like very different than it was ten years ago. And then like so now we're into like LinkedIn, and when. Like, let's say two and a half years ago, I'd say, you know, you should be expecting 10% or above. Now I feel like mm, maybe that bar's lowered down to 5%. Like, if you're getting 5% on LinkedIn, it's probably pretty good. Um, and it's just going to keep dropping. And then there'll be some new thing that I can't, that we can't imagine yet that will replace LinkedIn or whatever. And, and, and so it just keeps, trans, you know, basically new channels open up. They become more and more popular. They get saturated. They don't be, they become less effective. And then, it, and then the new channel pops up. And it's just a recurring cycle that just keeps speeding up. Um, so yeah, um, like it depends on the channel, but right now, if you're doing over email, like getting anything close to 1% is great. You're doing on LinkedIn. I think 1% is not very good. So you might have a market, but it might be, you might, you're probably not targeting it very well, or it might not be very big. Um, but if you're seeing like anything close to 10% on LinkedIn, then that's great. So yeah. And like these numbers might not be relevant in 2021. These are relevant to like February 2020. Uh, assume they're lower in the future. Yeah, that's that's interesting. But then, what I think about is, um, yeah, even though like let's say there's a market, look, there's a channel and it's saturated, but you, you're just trying to learn, like you're just trying to kind of prove your idea, and you said, oh. I reached out to 50 people, 100 people, 200 people. It's not a lot if you think about it. Like it's not a lot of people and then the value that you get from that like even if you find just one person like an expert in that market yeah. that kind of teach you, teaches you all the problems that are present in that market, that's super valuable. Oh right? yeah. And I feel like if you don't do that uh, early enough, you're gonna lose that opportunity of like learning about the market you you care about. Yeah. So I think people should start there, right? To yeah, try to find yeah. maybe like one or two people that are like really knowledgeable about a market that you don't understand enough, and then kind of figure out the problems and see if they want to help you or teach you something, right? Yeah. So like that's if you have a group of people you want to help but you don't know what to help them with um i think if you've already kind of gotten you know fixated on a specific problem and you're trying to like validate it and sort of get a deeper understanding of it that you can kind of skip that step a little bit and go and just reach out to people specifically with that problem in mind but that being said like if you do that and no one responds and no one wants to talk to you I mean, maybe you need to like, if you're doing it on LinkedIn, like maybe you just need to like update your LinkedIn profile and come off more professionally. Maybe they're just like, they, there's a trust component too, right? So it's like, there's a relevance component and then there's like a trust component or like, um, like a, you could almost, it's almost like, re like re equity or relationship equity or something. It's like, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I will just say trust. There's like, do they trust like that you're not gonna waste their time? Something like that. And so like, let's say, You've got you've worked at Google, you've worked at Microsoft, you you got like this crazy LinkedIn profile, you got a really nice professional headshot and beautiful banner image and your headline is something relevant to them like you know we help eight, I, I'm like trying to help HR HR leaders solve XYZ problem and that's why you're reaching out. Like so everything lines up. Like your trust sort of bar is like really high. Um, they're much more likely to say yes. So there's the relevance component which is like are you asking about a job to be done or a problem or whatever that's relevant to them that they actually care about and then there's the like do the, are you coming off like creepy or, or like untrustworthy? Like, is there some red flag that, you know, you're waving around that, you know, you're not aware of, uh, which is why people are ignoring. So you want to be conscious of that too, um, and be presentable and like actually think about it from a marketing perspective. Um, but, but generally speaking, yeah, like if you're not already fixated on a problem and you're trying to find problems, then yeah, like reaching out to uh, like a market expert basically like a, an i like a like the the personification of the type of person you want to help 
and ask them about what the most important problems are and probably get a few different opinions on that, then that might be a, a really good way to uh, find a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, don't have a ton of experience with that though. I haven't been in that situation very many times. Okay. Or really ever, to be honest. I've come across startup founders who were though. Okay, that is actually something that we were discussing this week, I guess. Um, there are so many industries out there that do not have a bunch of resources like we do in the tech world. Let's say that I want to do that. I really wanted to find, I don't know, teachers, really people that use technology, but not in the same thing, the same way that we do. Um, do you have any advice for that? Um, how would I find a problem for a group of people that is really out of my reality, but that I really, it would give me a lot of uh, personal um, satisfaction, satisfaction to, to do that, for example? Yeah, well, I mean, like, this is like, I guess really, you know, I talked about how being a startup founder is like being an investigator at that early stage. Like that's a very much a phase thing. And this is a reality is like as a startup founder, you go through these phases of like through the trend, the, the like the journey or whatever, like you have to kind of be these different, you have to wear these different hats. I think everyone's heard that before. Hopefully um, you got to wear a lot of different hats. You got to play a lot of different roles. And, um, and so like there's a creative aspect and there's an analytical aspect. And so, you know, doing experiments or, you know, and then there's this like investigative sort of curious aspect with the interviews. I think when you have, let's say I'm going to think of an example, let's say you have a grandma or like a loved one who's dealing with something like Alzheimer's or, or arthritis or, uh, uh, you know, like some kind of problem that is like, has this emotional element to you. Like you're like, oh man, if I could solve this problem for people, I'd be, so uh, like, I, this has come up a couple of times and I hope that people don't listen to this and be like, oh, I should go do that because I think it's actually a really challenging one for other reasons. But here's an example. So let's say you want to help, uh, like you have, let's say you have a loved one who is Alzheimer's and they, they like wander out from their, where their care facility or their home or whatever, and like wander out into traffic or something. And there's like this big scary event. Maybe someone got hurt, maybe not, but like, you don't want that to happen again. So you go to, out to try and solve that problem. You're like, I want to help families with family members with Alzheimer's avoid their, this person going, getting into danger. Um, and, uh, so it's like, okay, well, how do I find more people like that to talk to? And that becomes really difficult. Mm -hmm. How do you find those people? Right. And so that's where the creative element comes in. Like you need to kind of bounce back between this different, these different sort of ways of thinking. Like sometimes you need to be really analytical. You need to be really sort of like curious and investigative, but other times you need to just be genuinely creative and like ask yourself like, Oh man, how can I find these people? Like, and you brainstorm and then you go talk to other, talk to your friends, talk to your parents. You're not validating the thing right now. Like you're just asking for like ideas as to how you might find more people like that. And then you might say, oh, well, so-and-so, my friend has such and such. And oh yeah, no, what about, and then you get referrals. And so that's, you start with that. You start with the people, you know, trying to refer you to other people they know that are relevant. And, and then you start learning more and you learn more and you maybe end up talking to a nurse and you're like, oh, well, you come down to the care facility and, you know, meet a couple of families in the waiting room and, and it just kind of grows up from there. You kind of just need to hack it. Um, there won't be a one size fits all answer to that. It depends on the market, depends on what you're pursuing. Did that help? Yes, a lot. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Say you did your homework, you talked to people, you kind of validated your idea. So it makes sense. How do you go from pain to solution or how do you go from a problem that really s exists to a solution like is it like a, a new app or a new website or whatever how do you go from a to b yeah um so there's kind of like an easy answer and then like, okay i would personally like how i would do it versus how i think most people probably would do it it's a bit different. I would lean heavily on this thing called Outcome Driven Innovation by Anthony Alwick. It's like a company called Stratagen. Um, and there's like a, I, I got trained in it. Um, and there's a pretty cool, I think it's called uh, Jobs to be Done Theory to Practice. And it's a one hour video on YouTube. And there's, I think there's other videos around this stuff, but this is the one I've watched it like five times. Um, and there's like this like milkshake video, like song at the beginning. Like if you hear that, it's like a lecture. If you like hear this milkshake song in the video, you know you got the right video. <laughs> um, and 
uh, basically it's okay. So you 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 first you sort of identify like when you when you're understanding what the problem is, like you're mapping it out. And so what does that mean? So to me that means well you understand idea like you have some ideas around the motivations as to why, and and the methods as to how, and you you actually map it out like a process. So you're like okay to get ex- to get this job done, there are these steps, and you know, so you need to like um, basically define the job that you're trying to get done. Like, like you imagine every person is going through this. So like there's some period of time where they're like figuring out or realizing that they need to do this thing. They need to make this progress. They need to get this job done. And and you know there's a, and then there's a period where they're like collecting information on how to get the job done. And then they're bringing together all the components of that job, like the tools or the resources or whatever. They're, like they're, they're searching for tools and things, uh, solutions. And then maybe they're setting them all up. And then they're using them. And then they're uh, monitoring the, how they're being used or that they're, whether they're working, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Maybe they're modifying something about the way they're running. And then eventually they're concluding and sort of wrapping up and calling the quote, job done, right? And so they kind of go through these steps. And so you want to map out all those steps. What's it like? And at every one of those steps, what are all the things that people want to avoid um, happening, like avoid things going wrong or like they want to speed up, they want to skip that step because it's like a really uncomfortable, like annoying step. And so you, you're kind of doing almost like a Six Sigma sort of process analysis sort of thing here where, you know, once you anchor yourself on the job to be done and it's the thing that people care about and you validate that through discovery, and you're, so you're working from that to a solution, you really want to map out like, well, what are the things that people really care about in that? Like, how do I make getting this job done better? Well, it's you got to remove friction. You got to remove obstacles. That's like everybody talks about great products, removing friction. Um, so, and you you look at any like leapfrog innovation or like really like really successful product, like you imagine the way things were done before versus after. It's like, oh man, they either like made some job that was so difficult, no one is even trying to do it, uh, super easy, or they took something that people were trying to do and like were, were just hated it, and like even though they like they kind of had to do it, so they kept doing it even though it was really frustrating and difficult, and you made it really easy. Um, and you do that by systematically breaking down all of the things that people don't like about that experience and then removing them by with design. And that's just the design process. And frankly, there's an element of creativity. You gotta be someone who knows how to make stuff. And it's very easy to get stuck if you're a developer or an engineer, you know, you kind of like if you know if you know how to make software, then you're probably gonna make a software product. And maybe that's fine. And so, you know, you stick to that, what you know. Um, I probably wouldn't advise that, like, you know, a software developer try to make a medical product or, you know, <laughs> vice versa. Like, that's why they stick to what you know. Find co-founders if, you know, you want to go beyond that. But, um, but yeah, like, once you've kind of mapped all those things out and you know what pe- what matters to people, like, you can do surveys and you can kind of do lots of interviews and you can do experiments to kind of, like, bring more um, confidence in all of those details. But once you have those details, coming up with a solution becomes easier and fun. Like it's a creative exercise, like anything. And you iterate, like don't try and like solve it perfectly to come up with, you know, iterations. But like once you kind of get to the point where you have a a solution idea or a product idea, then you want to do like a product interview where just like we did, we talked about before, you do an interview where you don't talk about the product at all. And so you don't mention the product at all. You actually can have a solution interview. So once you, but you don't want to do this first. Like you, first you want to do a problem interview. So let's say you've interviewed 20 or 30 people about problems and then you map it all out like we're talking about and you kind of build that whole, like I call it, I think it's called a job map. I don't know what I've been calling it. I don't know what, I can't remember what Anthony calls it. Um, But you map out all the friction and all the um, uh, steps in the the process of getting that job done. Uh, And you design a solution around that. Like you ultimately you need to kind of validate that. So you go back to all the people who you talk to the first time around in the in the problem interviews and you say, Hey, I think I have a solution. I'd love to talk to you about it. And there's a particular way to do that. And um Google solution interview Ash Maria. And there's like a couple blog posts about it. I think Customer Forces Canvas is good. I, th- I th- think there's one around that, like the new customer courses for- forces canvas or something like that. Um, but yeah, but basically, you know, it turns into a sa- bit of a sales conversation. I think the main difference between it and, a, and a, like a, an average sales conversation is just everything's a hypothesis. So like how every step of the way, like you kind of design a pitch, like that's really what you're trying to do is you're basically at a point of selling. So you design before you've built it, right? Um, maybe you ask yourself, like, what is the ask? Like, what do you want? Like, there should be a call to action that you want them to take. So that's the key. And so you want them to sign up or you want them to make a deposit or you want them to prepay or whatever, right? But make it something that there's friction. Like, it shouldn't be easy. You you want to make it hard for them to say yes. 
Because if you, you don't, you want to avoid false positives, like we talked about, right? So you don't want to make it as easy as possible. Your goal isn't to make it as easy as possible for them to say yes. In fact, it's that probably to make it as hard as possible for them to say yes without, you know, being silly about it. And um, so you should have a price. You should make it higher than you think it should be. Oh, the most common, like way more common for startups to underprice than to overprice. So whatever price you're wanting to probably pick something, you probably need to like double it or something. Like it's very, very common for startups mm -hmm. to underprice. Um, because they try to make up for like the lack of product market fit, but just like lowering a price, which is like really silly, just makes everything harder. Um, yeah, and so you know you do basically these problem interviews, and you treat them all like like all of the everything you you map it all out. You kind of script it, and and every step of things that you say, you have an expected response, and that's like your hypothesis. So you're like, if I say this, I think they'll say that, and then any time in the interview they don't say what you thought they were going to say like basically they surprise you your hypothesis is invalidated you stop you don't like keep going blindly you dig in you're like oh wow okay they didn't respond they didn't they react the way i expected so why so then you'd start asking a bunch of questions and you understand them better and then maybe you can keep going on after that or maybe that just ends the interview right there because you're totally like the whole all the rest of your hypothesis have been invalidated all at once um but uh, yeah, if, if you, people react the way you expect them to, and then you go all the way to the point where you make a pitch and you say, this is, you know, um, I, I think Ash Maria suggests you ask them what they would pay. And then you say, okay, well, actually, this is the price we've decided. Would you still buy it? Something like that. I don't know. If there, I think it's just his opinion. I don't know how much science is behind that. But so I don't know if there's a super right or wrong way. But eventually, you got to get to the point where you're like, this is the price. Will you buy it? And um, yeah. And if people say yes, well, then you're in a good state. If you get like the best thing you can do to de-risk a startup is get people to pre-order your product, uh, and then you, all you have to worry about is execution, which is great. It's most what most people are focused on in the first place. So you're kind of back to where you thought you were in the first place. But now you know that at least if you succeed, you will have a business, not just a whole bunch of payroll that you have to figure out how to pay <laughs> when no one wants to buy it. <laughs> yeah, that's very true, and it's also very different from the like the common way that people do it. They start with this this MVP. They try to like figure out if people will buy it or not, and they show it to people, and they kind of try to force it on people. Say, hey, I have this MVP. It's really cheap now. It's gonna be more expensive later when it's done. Do you want to buy it? And the person's like, oh, maybe talk to me later when it's done, you know. Yeah. And then you keep pushing, you keep building, and then eventually you figure out, oh, no one wants this thing. <laughs> that yeah. I spent so much time building. Yeah, but that's that's a very different process. Yeah, um, yeah. I basically, people think, and I know because I've been in the state multiple times. You think that you need to build it because they won't get it unless they can see it. It's not it. You don't get the problem. If they don't get it, it's not because you haven't built it yet. It's because you're talking to some, them about something they don't really care about, and maybe you're confused because they've people have been too nice to you because you've been asking the questions the wrong way, and you keep getting false positives. So if you're in this state of you're like, why don't like I keep like I keep making this thing better and and it should be what people want, but they don't get it um, because you've gone this sort of MVP first route. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's probably just because like you're not actually working on something that anyone cares about. Like maybe you're making a cool thing and like it does help with this like quote unquote job to be done, but no one's trying to get that job done. Like you can't make someone want something new; they have to already want that. And then you like fit into what they already want. Um, big, big, big brands can maybe change people's perspectives of what they want with like really robust marketing campaigns, very sophisticated, um, lots of money involved. If you're a startup, you can't do that. You got to find something that people already want and then give it to them. And if you think, well, well, like you know, what about you know? There's this Henry classic, like Henry Ford um, quote. I think something like, if I asked people what they want, they would have said a faster horse. Um, I mean, it's kind of like it's misleading because the truth is like you can't like people do know what they want. It's just you can't like ask them to invent a product to so give them what they want. Like you can you ask it like the progress they want to make, like in certain situations, how do they wish that went differently? Like what what's frustrating? Like you can ask someone about their experience doing something and they can tell you all about the things they like and don't like. And that's what they, they want to get rid of the things they don't like. And they want more of the things they do like, like it's like not it's not this mystical like you don't have to be steve jobs <laughs> or you know elon musk or whatever to come up with these crazy ideas like you uh yeah i don't know it's just let's demystify it a little bit it's yeah. pretty pretty practical when you really think it through
Please don't be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to that like doors and keys analogy, and like anytime you're thinking about building something and then trying to like shop it around, it's like you made a key, and now you're trying to go rock, or walking around opening random doors. Like, what are the likelihood you're going to open a door? Yeah. Do you think that the startup culture, like if you, if we talk about Y Combinator or uh, some companies from Silicon Valley? They always focus on like the really s the the companies that get a lot of money, a lot of investors' money, are usually made up made up of uh, engineers, you know. But if I'm if I understand what you're saying, maybe you don't need to be like a genius engineer to figure out a, a really important problem mm -hmm. and. The hard part is figuring out the problem, and that doesn't require any engineering knowledge, right? And then after you figure out the problem, the, the the real pain, you can just hire an engineer to solve that for you, or maybe maybe you need some engineering mind to kind of help solve that problem, kind of invent the solution. Yeah. But like, you don't need to be an engineer. Right? No, not necessarily. I mean, there's lots of startups, successful startups that were f started by non-technical founders that like hired people or found a technical founder later. I'm not saying it's like common to be successful that way. I'm not, and I'm not saying it's like a way to like maximize your success, but it is possible for sure. Um, yeah, and like, like you know, co companies get into like Y Combinator commonly and they like pivot their idea like they they get their like one thing why Combinator will be good at is like like really forcing you like shoving your face in your validation like your startup's validation and like not letting you like holding you accountable to that uh so you'll learn quickly uh, like they used, we were talking earlier about how long does it take well if you go through Y Combinator it doesn't take long because like they'll pull the, all their resources all their networks of everyone that's gone through Y Combinator and all the founders of Y Combinator like people running Y Combinator they know like everybody who needs like yeah they can like get into any market and so they'll help you validate like fast and they're, um, it's like 500 startups tech stars there's a bunch of great accelerators uh, in the states and probably others in the rest of the world I'm just not as familiar with um, but uh, so so it can be done more fa like faster depending on the circumstances. And very, I think it's quite common for like them to bring in a, a founding team because like, okay, they're, they have like, they're really smart, they're resourceful, they're super dedicated, they've made all kinds of sacrifices to get this far. Uh, like these are kinds of some of the things you need. Like um, there's like personality traits that they look for and like the people more so than the other things or at least as much so as the other things because to them it's like, okay, if because they have actually a bunch of really six I can't remember exactly which ones they were. Brex, Brex, we were just talking about Brex. Brex came in as something completely different. I think they're Y Combinator. Uh, they were one of those accelerators. I'm pretty sure Y Combinator, but they, I remember hearing the story actually. So they came in with some completely different idea, and they had a background in like credit cards, and they were trying to do something completely different, like some manufacturing automation system. They knew nothing about. They didn't know about the customer. They didn't know like the market. They didn't know the problem. And really quickly, they, the whole thing got disvalidated. And then they're like, "What do we do?" And uh, they went around to all the different startup founders at, I want to say Y Combinator. I hope it's Y Combinator. I hope I'm not misinforming people mm -hmm. with this. But I'm like, yeah, I'm almost certain this, this like, I, yeah, I remember the story. So they talked to all the startup founders and asked, uh, you know, what are the problems they're just dealing with? And they heard about the credit card problem, which if someone had asked me at just the right time, that's exactly what I would have said because I've faced that problem myself here. Um, and, and then they're like, well, we know credit cards. So I guess they probably heard a whole bunch of different problems, but they chose that one because it was the one they had the background in, and then they got Brex. So and that, I'm like 99% I'm like sure that was a Y Combinator example where they came in, got invalidated within like a month, and then pivoted, and then they had a huge success. So yeah, I can't even remember what your question was. I feel <laughs> like I went totally off topic. I got all excited when I thought of that. <laughs> yeah. what, did, what do you think about bootstrapping? Because we're talking about like startups, like, you want to get a problem that uh, is gonna like it's a real pain point, and you're gonna grow, want to grow a lot. But what if we're we're talking about bootstrapping a business? Like it doesn't need to be the most important pain point in the world, but it's a, it's a good enough problem that is going to like you're gonna make money off of it. You can have a good lifestyle off of it. Uh, 
Do you think it would be different for a bootstrap business? Or I guess it, it should be the same, right? You, you still need to figure out the problems. You need to uh, yeah. find a solution. But well, you don't need to run as fast, maybe. Um, yeah, and I'm actually remembering something else I thought about your last question, which is like you're looking for a problem. Um, and this is kind of related to the bootstrap one, to be honest. So like... Um, you know, here, here's a problem. Like, if you wanted to go, let's say, so, someone who wanted to travel, like, long distance, like, anyone who wants to, like, travel over uh, 500 kilometers or miles or whatever, um, you could, like, map out what that is like. So, let's say, like, taking a flight. And uh, you could you'd realize that that is, like, a huge market opportunity because people, most people hate flying. They hate the airport experience. They hate being in the like, tube with a bunch of people and the stink and the <laughs> air, dry air, and they get sick. And, like, there's just so many bad things about that. Um, but the hard part is this engineering as a solution. So back to your kind of engineering question before and, like, and, and this, like, idea of bootstrapping. Well, like, it kind of depends on, like, how much money do you have? Because bootstrapping is basically, like, you figure out how to pay for it yourself slash with the company's own operations. And so, the, the, like... There's kind of these two facets. So one is like, well, what is the problem you're going after? And like, how practical is that? Because some problems, like back to what you're saying before, like finding a problem, like you, I, it's, you can accidentally stumble in, into a really obvious problem that just maybe wasn't obvious to you at first. But like after you spend on it a while, you're like, oh man, yeah, this is actually a really obvious problem. Like people who had been in that space, like, like duh, it's a dull problem. And it's a huge problem. And it's like impossible right now to solve. Like, Peter Thiel, zero to one, he talks about like secrets. So there's like um, little tiny problems that are like insignificant. And then there's like really big obvious problems that are like impossible to solve. And in the middle, you kind of have this like sweet spot, like where they overlap or whatever, where it's like you find out about like an important problem that somehow like recently got unlocked with some new technology. So it's like 10 years ago, that was impossible. And now because of new technology, it becomes actually pretty feasible. And it just nobody happens to have noticed it yet or thought of it yet. That's a secret. And so like that's really what you're looking for. It's not that you're looking for a problem. It's look, You're looking for a problem that was recently unlocked that, frankly, like it's like a job to be done, this desired progress that um, some small group of people want, really, really want to make. And this is going to answer your bootstrap question. So you find a very small segment of people who really, really want to make this progress and they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. Um, and it only recently became possible to make that progress with some new technology. And the more people who make that progress, the more people will want to make that progress. So in other words, you serve the first thousand people and then there'll be 10,000 people who l like see that, oh my God, they did that, that's possible now, now I want that. and. And as you do it more and more, you'll get better and more efficient at it. Your costs will come down, your product or service or whatever will get better. And so your market will sort of expand with you making it more accessible, right? And so you can probably think of a lot of examples. When you think about this, like all sorts of different, like really successful products kind of happen this way, where it's like people went, oh my God, now that's possible. And, uh, and, and then flocked to the new thing. They didn't necessarily want it beforehand. There was someone out there who did though. Um, and like, so, you know, an example, I think Airbnb, it was like, I, they, you know, they struggled to try and launch on a couple of occasions. And then I think they had like, like it went click when they were doing it for, I think South by Southwest, where there was all these people who are like, I just need someone to stay. I just want to get to the conference. Like I don't, uh, all the hotels are booked out. I like, they really, really wanted that progress. Like they would happily shack up in some random person's apartment. They didn't care. They just wanted to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, once like that had been made a cultural norm and like that had happened, then more people saw that and are like, oh, that's interesting. Like I'd do that for a vacation. And so I, you know, there's a kind of, you know, bitter, longer story in between those two points, but, but yeah. Um, sorry, I think I drifted off your last question <laughs> by trying to answer your previous question more. So can you ask your last question again? So what about bootstrapping? Bootstrapping, right. So, <laughs> so when you find that, like, if you find this like hot, small segment of people who really, really want it and will be willing to pay a high premium for it, then you can bootstrap. Um, so really it boils down to like, can you, like, how do you start? Because there's a lot of startups that, you know, you can imagine, well, if I just created this platform that had these features in it, like everyone would want to use it. It would be amazing, 
right? And so you maybe take a stab at that and it sucks. It's nowhere close to what you'd envisioned. And you realize, well, the only way this is going to be great is if there's like a million people on it, like filling it up with information or whatever. Okay. Makes sense. But how do you get to that point? So like, how do you start it? Like starting is usually the hard part. It's not coming up with the idea. It's not even necessarily identifying the market need. It's like, how do you actually get from nothing to there? It's like you, okay, it's like a mountain. You can see the summit from the ground, but how do you actually traverse your way up the mountain? How do you start? It's very easy to accidentally take a dead end, right? Like go up the wrong way and then you run into a, like a total cliff face and you can't get up it. Um, so, you know, I, it's why it's easier for people who have a track record. If you've flipped a couple start, like built and sold a couple startups, you have like $20 million of your own, um, you know, and experience, you can, it's easier to bootstrap all these things. If you have no experience and you, um, you know, you, and it, you're, yeah, it's hard, man. Like it's, sometimes it's not possible to bootstrap. You generally, you want to try and like, frankly, it'll be far easier to raise funds. Like if you're in a situation where you're like, okay, do I, do I raise money or do I bootstrap? Um, like the answer is probably both. Um, because if you get some revenue in the door, you get some bootstrap, it shows grit. You're more, people are more likely to give you some money. They have a little more faith that like you'll actually get the job done or like, get, you know, get certain distance. Um, and uh, whereas if you're just trying to go hit the street, raise money and you talk to like a hundred investors or whatever, and you haven't had any success, like then that's kind of like you didn't accomplish anything along the way. Yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of a tricky question to be honest. Um, and it depends on the situation, but generally you want to try to bootstrap and you do that by just getting people to pay as soon as you can. And what, what I would have probably suggest avoiding is bootstrapping by like, so it's like, here's a situation I was in that I would warn people against. So you make an assumption about what the product is, or you build a product rather without understanding a market need and you're going around trying to sell it and you're running out of cash or whatever, or like, you know, maybe you never had any cash. And so you're trying to make up for the lack of nobody buying the thing you made. Um, by you know selling services or something. So like you know we had a couple engineers. We have payroll. We're trying to like keep the lights on, pay everybody, and so to make up for the gaps and sort of projects we had with potential customers, we would fill it in with some like custom development work or you know, just trying to keep the lights on. It's really distracting. So like you're already kind of in a precarious position when you're like in that like state where you're just trying to keep the payroll going. Um, in hindsight, like there were situations, and it's like hard. This is a like, hard, hard thing. Like there's a lot of, you're going to have to do a lot of hard stuff as a startup founder. You're going to have to make some tough decisions. You're going to have to do, there's a lot of like going against like what feels right. Um, and one of those things would, is going to be like, you, if you're in a situation where you've got a startup, maybe you raised a little money or you got some distance, maybe you got a big contract or something. And so you kind of got some way to bootstrap you going and now you're running out of cash. You got, let's say a hundred grand in the bank. It's like four months. And you just real, you're starting to realize you've got no idea what the market opportunity is. You've got these like four engineers you're paying, let them go right away like now, um, basically keep that hundred thousand dollars is going to be what you need to build the real thing. When you really have a market opportunity, if you realize now you don't have a market opportunity, don't pay those engineers for four months when you don't know what they should be building. Like, mm -hmm. I know it's hard. I know it sucks. You don't want to let them go, but really you should like cut yourself all the way down to nothing and then build yourself all the way back up fresh, clean slate. Even if like you're gonna use that money for something other than what the uh, investors originally gave it to you for or whatever you plan on doing with it or whatever. Um, you might need to get some people on board. I mean, don't like piss people off, don't be a jerk about it, but like do it in a way that's like nice, you know, give people severance if you can or whatever. But um, but yeah, like it's often you gotta do these like really difficult, like uncomfortable things is, is the right thing in some situations. And I think um, if you're gonna bootstrap, you wanna be bootstrapping off of the actual market need, uh, not um, something else that's a distraction. Yeah. I feel like that was a super long winded convoluted <laughs> answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Like we, we always learn stuff from Kenny because Kenny knows like how to do stuff, like how to prove that the market uh, works, you know? So I always learn a bunch of stuff when I talk to you and you you really need to come back again because I have a bunch of other questions like we had a bunch of questions to ask you but we, we're running out of time but yeah it was really really cool ch to chat with you today like I learned a bunch of stuff and I think that people that listen to the podcast we also learn a, a ton and yeah 
most people are doing the wrong thing and we need to educate them so they can do the right things, solve the right problems and be successful. So thank you so much for coming today. My pleasure. It was really fun. Thanks, Tiago. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. Uh, and what if our listeners want to reach out to you? How can they do that? Um, best way is probably LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn. So Kenny McKenzie, uh, predictable revenue, you know, depending on when you're listening to this year from now or whatnot. Um, yeah. I mean, you'll find that in my work experience. So Kenny McKenzie, predictable revenue. Thanks for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoy it as much as we did. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and to our newsletter. You can do that by visiting hexdevs.com. And yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>